Greetings and welcome to this edition of Berkeley Conversations. I'm Dan Mogulov from UC Berkeley's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. In what seemed like a heartbeat, it was a single virus, officially known as SARS-CoV-2, that swept around the world and upended life as we know it. The rapid spread and the power of the virus has been taking even experts by surprise. Today, we're going to be taking a deep and interesting dive into viruses in general and this new coronavirus in particular. How do they move from animals to humans? How does a virus hijack our own cells? How does a virus evade our immune systems? And how do antiviral drugs actually work? Our panelists today are Professor Britt Glunsinger from the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology and Dr. Kara Brook, who is a Miller postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, and before we get going, just a reminder that we invite all of you who are watching us through Facebook Live to post any questions you may have during the course of our conversation, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, Britt and Kara, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. You know, I, I want to start, Britt, you're a virologist, and, and Kara, you're an expert in disease ecology, and particularly in how uh, these viruses spread from animals to humans. And before we came on today, you were both talking that it was uh, there was one particular book, something called Hot Zone, that actually launched or got both of you interested. So, Kara, let me start with you. What did you read in that book and what attracted you to this world of, of sort of viruses and disease and animals and humans? Um, great, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so Richard Pre Preston's The Hot Zone tells the story of the emergence of Ebola restin, which is one of the species of Ebola virus that's actually not pathogenic to humans, but um, spilled over in a monkey holding fa facility uh, in Reston, Virginia, or, or emerged among monkeys um, and sort of sparked a national uh, controversy and awareness of Ebola virus. And um, he kind of describes the past history of of, uh, Ebola viruses and other zoonoses and um, walks through a number of interviews with scientists and I read it as a high school student and that really got me fascinated uh, with the world of emerging viruses and in particular viruses derived from bats as we think that uh, most filoviruses that um, transmit to humans are as well as this SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. So you're saying so bats don't just look scary is that there's actually a good reason for that? Um, I wouldn't say that bats look scary. Um, I am a bat conservationist at heart as well. And in fact, the, the types of bats that I study, the fruit bats, the flying foxes found in Africa are, uh, are um, quite, quite attractive. They have dog-like faces and we call them flying foxes. So um, they certainly do harbor viruses that pose potential threats to humans, but I think that there are ways to, to coexist pe peacefully with both bats and viruses without needing to be afraid of either. So we're going to be talking in a lot more detail about that, the whole process and the phenomenon of transmission from animal populations to human populations. But Britt, let me come to you. You were saying that you read the same book and um, that helped launch your academic career as a virologist. What appealed to you? What caught your attention? Why this particular subject? Yeah, I was an undergraduate at the time. Uh, and I was interested in science, but I was a little bit free floating. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. I thought I might go to medical school and, and on a whim I had picked up this book and I ended up reading it in one sitting. And I remember thinking as I was going through it, the first half of the book, I thought these people are crazy. They're telling the story of, of physicians and scientists who are going and tackling these viruses like Ebola that do god awful things to their human hosts when they get into them. And, and by the end of the book, I remember thinking that whatever these entities were, these viruses, that they were just fascinating. And that became the hook that, that started what has been my entire career focused on how these work. And, and the thing that, that actually hooked me, I never ended up working on the types of viruses that were talked about in that book, but it was the concept that you could have this entity that had a set of instructions, its genomes that is a million times or more smaller than the genomes of the cells that they infect and the people that they infect. And yet sometimes only having five or 10 or 15 genes compared to the 20,000 or so genes that we humans have, they could wreak such havoc. And so how do they do that? 
How are they such masters of genetic economy? How do they take over our cells? Those have been questions that have been just fascinating to me throughout my career. And that was the book that sort of got me hooked into thinking about that. So let me ask both of you the same question. I've been asking this of all faculty who have some expertise in this area. You know, I think for a lot of us, this whole thing came out of nowhere. And we've realized since that there were many people, including Bill Gates, sort of sounding the warning warning alarms about the potential threat of viruses, but what surprised you? If, if anything has, is this something you've been waiting for or expecting? Over the course of the last four or five months as all of this has unfolded, what have you noted? What has startled you? Britt, let me start with you on that. Yeah, I think that any virologist that you ask will say this was coming. We didn't know what virus was coming. Many of us anticipated it would be flu as we're overdue for another flu pandemic and flu could still well be coming. Um, but coronaviruses were certainly on the radar. We had two spillovers relatively recently of highly pathogenic coronaviruses as well. So the surprise was not that it happened. Um, I think unfortunately the surprise is also not the speed with which the virus is spread as scary as that's been. We know from the first SARS outbreak that, you know, a person from any area of the world within a day or two can travel by air to any other place in the world. And with this virus, unfortunately, the fact that you can transmit it before you have any symptoms or when symptoms seem mild means that you, you know, with world travel, you can spread everything uh, around the globe with the speed that it's been spreading. And so, those unfortunately were not surprises, but things that we were dreading um, happening and did indeed happen. Uh, I will say that the surprises to me, um, aside from you know the, the 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 horrible economic and personal toll that this has taken on everybody, on a more optimistic note, has been how amazingly rapidly the scientific community has come together and moved forward with things like we'll talk more in detail later, but vaccine development, you know, this takes decades uh, often to develop a vaccine. The fastest on record was the Ebola virus vaccine, which took about five years. And we're trying to crank something out now on a 12 to 18 month aspirational timeframe. So to have those type of goals, to have the entire scientific enterprise, whether or not they're virologists, um, bringing in their expertise to bear to try and come up with creative solutions, how that has worked um, to me is, you know, a delightful surprise. Carol, same question. What's, uh, as all this has sort of washed over the world in the last five months, what have you noted? What surprised you as a scientist in this realm? Yeah, I guess I would echo what Britt has to say in that um, as a disease ecologist and an epidemiological modeler, we've always been aware of the risk of a pandemic. Um, many of us have hypothesized that it's likely to be influenza and there's quite a number of uh, studies out there about hypothetical pandemic emergence and what the sort of response might need to be to control something like that. As somebody with a specialty in bat-borne viral zoonoses, so those pathogens that transmit from bats to humans, um, I'm well aware that uh, these um, animals do pose a risk as a source of human infection, but typically the bat-borne pathogens that we've seen have tended to be more virulent in the human host, so caused higher case fatality rates and less transmissible. And of course, SARS-CoV-2 does cause a significant number of human mortalities, um, but a lower mortality rate than what has been previously seen in SARS-CoV-1, for instance, or in MERS, which um, means that it's able to spread um, in addition to some of the natural history of the pathogen, like Britt mentioned, it's, its ability to transmit before symptoms, but it means that it's able to transmit faster um, when it doesn't kill its host quite so rapidly. Um, so um, I, I think that we all on an academic level are aware of these risks, but never still really expect to be in the midst of, of the outcome. Um, so that has been surprising. Um, I think also um, I've been pleasantly surprised to see how quickly uh, epidemiological terminology and understanding and, and sentiment has taken hold across the global population, terms like flatten the curve and are not the basic reproduction number for the pathogen, things that I've been studying my whole life are now, um, are now 
in every newspaper and um, part of, of um, many discussions uh, amongst people of a variety of backgrounds. Um, so it's exciting to see uh, how we are all interested in understanding and learning and tackling this problem together. So given that you both said this was a known risk and it's something that didn't entirely surprise you, why doesn't it happen more often? Why isn't this something the world has been dealing with every single year? Is it rare? Is it difficult? Is that leap from animal population to human population? I mean, when this passes, should we expect another 100 or 200 years until the next one? How do we think about the likelihood of this happening again? And how rare is it that it happened this time? Karen? Um, yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, I would say that it's probably less rare than we're admitting to ourselves. Um, it's rare that a, uh, a zoonotic virus, so a virus that emerges from animals to humans, becomes pandemic and infects humans in every country on earth. Um, but it's not necessarily rare that those emergence events take place. So just in the past 20 years from bats alone, we've seen cross-species zoonosis of Hendra and Nipah Hennepa virus, SARS and MERS coronaviruses, likely Ebola and also Marburg filoviruses. Um, and we see um, almost annual outbreaks of Nipah virus in Bangladesh that are discrete spillover events. So that, that cross-species emergence. Um, so the rare bit is, is a bit of bad luck and that we actually um, have the emergence of a virus that um, appears to be quite transmissible in the human population, able to effectively bind uh, human cell receptors and um, transmit well from human to human. So most of these pathogens are adapted to their natural reservoir host and less effective at transmitting uh, between humans until, um, until that initial emergence takes place. Britt, what do you think about all that? How have you been thinking about this like a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, once in a century, or is, have we just been lucky for the past few hundred years? I wouldn't say we've been lucky. Um, as Kara mentioned, even in just the past couple of decades, there have been spillover events of number of viruses. So just thinking about coronaviruses, right? Um, to have something like SARS, which came out in 2003, MERS, which emerged several years after that, those are just you know 10 years apart you have two highly pathogenic viruses that spilled over from bats into humans, not to mention the things like Nipah and Hendra and um, Ebola, which tends to move in and out of animal populations into humans. So to me, that says that um, these are regular occurrences and they're likely to probably be more regular occurrences as we as humans are interfacing more and more with animal populations, not just from um, you know, wild animal markets or things like that, but deforestation and forcing animals into higher stress situations and places where they're gonna come in more contact with humans. To me, it is not surprising that we are gonna continue to see these spillover events. Uh, there are obviously big barriers for a virus to be able to move from one host to another host. So I think there's a lot of what we would call chatter at that virus uh, the, the, the interface between a, a host like a bat or another reservoir host and human. So many, maybe many, many attempts um, that fail, but amongst those thousands or hundred thousands or, or maybe millions of failed attempts, all you need is one to succeed. We saw that with HIV. Uh, we've seen that this time with COVID-2. And so um, we may see that again as uh, uh, influenza continues to sort of chatter between the bird population and humans as well. So I wouldn't say we're lucky. I would say that that we're experiencing what one might expect we're gonna experience. And I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to experience these things in the future, although hopefully not to the extent that we're seeing it right now with this one. This was a bad one. So given your belief, and it seems like a solid one, <laughs> that we should expect more of these in the future, let's take a step back for a second and to the very foundation, which is what is a virus? How do they work? How does it invade a cell? How does it replicate? Is it alive? I have thought I've heard that viruses are not alive, but then I've heard that after 72 hours on a surface, they're no longer dangerous. So did they die or 
give us a little primer on what viruses are and how they work. Yep, these are excellent questions. So I think of a virus fundamentally as a set of instructions, hmm. right? They've got a set of instructions, which is their genetic material, their genomes, the same way we have genomes, they're just much smaller. And that set of instructions is fragile and can't get anywhere on its own. And so it is covered with a protective coat. You can think of that protective coat almost as the vehicle that is protecting the driver, which is the set of instructions. And what a virus needs to do is to use that coat to get to a cell, get into the cell and release those instructions into the cell. And we don't consider viruses to be alive. The reason we don't consider viruses to be alive is that first of all, they're completely inert if they're outside of that cell that they're infecting. So yes, a virus might be able to exist on a surface for some period of time, but it's not doing anything on that surface. It's not growing, it's not replicating, it's not moving, um, it's just sitting there um, over time, you know, maybe degrading or something like that. It only has activity once it is in the context of a cell. Mm. It also has no capacity to generate its own energy. And this is one of the fundamental things that we use to define life. So they can't generate energy. They're entirely dependent on the cell's energy. So once the cell, once the virus is able to deposit that payload, its set of instructions into the cell, it needs to use the cell's machinery to basically read those instructions and carry them out. So a virus is an entity that is intimately dependent on the cell in order for it to amplify itself. And so what it's doing is it's getting in there, it's getting the cell to read those instructions in a way that is very similar to how the cell reads our own instructions right? Our instructions come in the form of our DNA genomes. Those are made, they're, they're tr what we call transcribed into what is termed a messenger RNA. That's basically the language that can be read by the ribosome. The ribosome is the machine in the cell that makes proteins, which are basically the workhorse of the cell, the things that, that do all of the activities that the cell needs. So the virus genome when it gets into the cell, it uses that cellular machinery and basically tricks it. It looks very similar to the same messages that exist in our own cells. And so it uses that cellular machine to make the viral proteins. And then those viral proteins go and do the work of making lots more copies of that set of instructions. And they also do the work of basically being spies and, um, you know, having their own sort of anti-cell army and that what they're doing is they're preventing the cell from recognizing that it's infected. They're trying to shut down the cell's antiviral defenses and coronaviruses are extremely good at this um, so that the cell cannot recognize as effectively that it's got a foreign invader and it can't stop that foreign invader as quickly as it would like before that virus has now made many copies of its instructions made many more of the um, components that are gonna be that coat that protect it so that those instructions can then be enveloped in that coat, released from the cell where they will either then go on to infect other cells within your lung if you're a coronavirus or be breathed out into the air through droplets to infect another person. So let's stay with the, let's stay with the sort of the general topic of viruses for a second. What accounts for their differentiation? I mean, we have a common cold virus, we get over it in a few days, not that big a deal. Then you've got something like Ebola, extraordinarily deadly, or something like HIV. Here we are some 40 years since the emergence of HIV and still no vaccine, even if there is a treatment. Why are some, why are some viruses so relatively harmless and, so, and some so incredibly deadly and impactful? Yep, the set of instructions are different for each of these viruses. So you can conceptually think of them as pretty similar, right? They're all a set of instructions covered by a coat, a coat of protein or a coat of lipid uh, plus protein. But what makes up those instructions? What are the proteins and what are those proteins directed to do? 
how are they changing the cell? How are they evading the immune system? How are they causing pathogenesis? They're different. And so the proteins that are made by something like HIV, the proteins that are made by something like Ebola, the proteins that are made by flu or by SARS-CoV-2, entirely different. Um, so while at their core, they're entities that you know are similar um, in that they've got instructions and they've got a coat and they can't do anything until they get inside the cell, those instructions and those components by and large are pretty different from virus to virus. Now, of course, you can have viruses that are related to each other. So there are seven known human coronaviruses, four of which mostly cause symptoms like the common cold and don't cause severe disease, three of which, uh, the, the original SARS, MERS, and this COVID-2 SARS cause very severe disease. So it's, a, it's also an interesting question. Those which have related proteins, related instructions, why is it that some of them cause very mild disease, some cause very severe disease? And the questions that, or the answers to those questions are pretty complicated and not fully understood. But for example, one explanation could be that the, the viruses, the coronaviruses that cause the common cold, well, they tend to be limited to the upper respiratory tract. So things like you know viruses or, or things that cause just relatively mild illness, a milder illness is one for a respiratory illness that tends to stay in the upper respiratory tract. You get infections of the lower respiratory tract that leads to pneumonia, uh, and very severe disease. So unfortunately, uh, SARS and CoV-2 happen to be viruses that can infect cells in the lower respiratory tract in addition to the upper respiratory tract, which may contribute to their high level of pathogenicity. There are probably many other factors that contribute to those differences too. Got it, Kara. I'm, Kara, I'm gonna to come to you in a second um, after this excellent primer on, on viruses and talk about the role bats have played yeah. in this, but sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just going to add on um, just from an evolutionary perspective that oh. a virus essentially needs to be able to reproduce itself as a new infection and a new host. And um, in my field of evolutionary theory, we talk about um, often what's called the transmission virulence trade-off, that for a virus to be able to infect a new host, it needs to be able to transmit from one health host to another. And the question of why a virus causes disease within that host, it's often a side effect of this need to transmit. So a virus doesn't fundamentally want to kill its host. That ends up often being detrimental to its goal of going on to transmit to a new host if that host dies too quickly. But sometimes the virus is mechanism of transmission requires it to achieve some kind of baseline density within a host so that there are enough virions or enough viral particles in a cough, for instance, that when that cough lands on a new host, it can go on to transmit. So the virus is, is faced by this challenge of reaching a state that's transmissible while avoiding killing its host too quickly such that it loses that opportunity to transmit. And as Britt said, um, we see this effect with respiratory infections where there's more pathology in the lower respiratory tract. And in the case of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, um, they're able to transmit because they do infect the upper respiratory tract, but then they can migrate and cause severe disease in the lower respiratory tract, often without pain, that evolutionary cost, often because they've already transmitted to a new host. And then it doesn't, um, they're, they're no longer sort of capped by the effects that they have on the original host, if that makes sense. It doesn't, but Kara, I have to note that you're talking about the virus like it's a person. And I'm curious <laughs> about that. You said it doesn't want to do this and it doesn't want to do that. Why do you talk about it that way? Yeah, forgive the anthropomorphizing. Um, no, no, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> um, it is under evolutionary selective pressures. So the virus um, is not conscious. This is true, um, just in the same way that many animal species are not conscious, um, but they are a set of genetic material that is going to is not going to exist anymore if they're not able to reproduce and replicate and create new infections. And so um, by saying wants to, um, essentially what I'm saying is that evolutionary selective pressures are going to extinguish that virus from our repertoire of, of possible viruses unless 
that virus is able to transmit to a new host. So I want to uh, present to both of you a question that just came in through Facebook Live and also remind people who may have joined us late that if you are watching us through Facebook Live, we invite you to submit questions. We're going to do our best to answer them. And this one that just came in, again, I'll throw it out to both of you, is while the virus is not alive, it must have started somewhere in some time. How do viruses begin? Britt, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, this is a great question. This is a question that that comes up. I, I teach a, an undergraduate virology course, and and we spend part of a lecture talking about this. It's an unknown, of course. Um, where did a virus originate? Were they the original forms of life? I, I tend to think of viruses as the first cheaters. <laughs> Anytime you've got a system, there's going to be something that tries to game the system, right? And so, in my mind, a virus is something that evolved as a way to copy itself maybe more quickly than what that original form of life was able to uh, use to copy itself. And so I think uh, that they probably emerged relatively you know, quickly or close to that of the last universal common ancestor. But this is uh, a widely debated topic to which we really don't have a good answer. Um, but I, yeah, like I said, I think of them as sort of the quintessential cheaters. In almost any living system, you start to look at it and you'll find cheaters that emerge and viruses are those. They're taking advantage of something else so that they can, you know, skip, skip through some loopholes and get things done quicker. Got it. Kara, anything you want to add to that on that question? I'll uh, defer to the virologist on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's turn to bats. Um, let's turn to the means of transmission. Um, I believe in, in the case of uh, the, uh, the new coronavirus, why are bats associated with so many emerging human diseases? What's the story with that, Kara? Yeah, um, so it's a bit debated in the literature whether bats actually host a disproportionate number of zoonotic viruses. So zoonosis, again, is the process of transmission from a wildlife reservoir to a human host. Uh, bats actually make up uh, about 20% of mammalian diversity. So there's the second most speciose mammalian order. So, um, so wait, hang on for a sec, unpack that for a sec, what you just said for us lay people who might have been political yes. science majors. So kingdom phylum class order family genus species is, is Linnaean taxonomy. Um, so class mammalia um, order is the subdivision in, in phylogenetic classification below mammals. And so for instance, humans are part of the order primates. Um, we also have an order rodentia that makes up all rodents and then bats are in their own order, chiroptera. Um, so rodents make up 40% of mammalian diversity and bats make up 20%. So bats and rodents together comprise 60% of all mammals. Right. Um, and what that corresponds to in the case of bats is um, between 14 and 1500 species, um, a number that's, that's growing every year because we describe more and more species. So just by, by pure numbers, we would expect a number of zoonoses to be linked sort of proportionally to the number of other mammals out there. And I should say that we are able to, um, there is cross-species transmission of viruses from non-mammals. So Britt mentioned that uh, uh, influenza comes from birds, um, but typically we see an inverse correlation. So a negative correlation between the phylogenetic distance of the host. So how distantly related the animal host is and the human. So we are more likely to acquire pathogens from another mammal than we are from a bird. That's not to say that we don't see pathogens transmit from birds to humans, but it's just uh, relatively less likely. Um, and so we tend to focus on mammalian zoonoses in, in many of the studies that sort of look at these comparative cross-scale events. Um, and we, um, there, we acquire many uh, zoonotic viruses from rodents and many from bats. And it's a bit debated whether um, there are more that emerge from bats than we would expect given their species number. But what hasn't been debated is that they do seem to be more virulent. So cause virulence is damage to the host and so more virulent to the human. So cause higher case fatality rates in the human host. And what we think for the reason, uh, the reason for that is, is that um, bats are very unique among mammals. They are the only flying mammal, the only mammal capable of sustained powered flight, which means that their physiologies are rather different than all other mammalian uh, taxa, which is a, a group, so something like an order. 
Um, and in particular, uh, bats achieve extremely high metabolic rates in flight. They, on average, will um, exhibit double the lifetime metabolic expenditure of a non-flying mammal. And to put it in perspective, a bat in flight will elevate its baseline metabolic rate up to 15-fold from resting um, wow. compared compared with a seven-fold increase for a rodent running at full speed or a two to three-fold increase for a human if, um, you know, if you ever wear a Fitbit or something like that that tracks your heart, heart rate as, you're, as you run. Um, and so for that reason, um, there are a number of uh, stressors accrued during basic metabolic processes, in, in particular, um, the release of these oxygen-free radicals. So you've probably heard of antioxidants as having a, a health yep. benefit. Um, and so metabolic processes tend to accumulate this oxidative damage over time. And typically, we see this inverse correlation between organisms that have very high mass specific metabolic rates and their lifespan. So organisms with high mass specific metabolic rates like a rodent tend to be very short lived, but bats have this really high metabolic rate and yet are uh, the longest lived for their body size of any known mammal. So the oldest described bat in the world, the Brant's bat has been documented living over 40 years in the wild compared with a rodent that only lives a couple of years uh, of about the same size. And so we think that flight as an evolutionary process is so physiologically intensive that for it to have ever evolved to begin with, bats had to evolve very unique mechanisms that allow them to dampen infl inflammation and repair some of that damage that's occurred during this normal metabolic process. And it just so happens that a virus causes damage within a cell and also recruits immune cells to the site of infection and causes inflammation in that way. And so this is again, all still hypothetical. Um, we're still piecing together these, these different molecular pathways, but we believe that flight has promoted bat tolerance of viral infection. So lack of disease symptoms with respect to some of these, um, to, to these, with upon infection with these viruses. And so I told you previously that we talk about this transmission virulence trade-off that a virus will evolve to sort of mediate the difference between how quickly it can pass itself on to a new host versus how quickly it's killing that original host. But when it virus is infecting a bat that doesn't experience disease upon that infection, it can evolve some of these traits such as replication rate or um, ability to, to mediate some of the host defenses that allow it to spread within the original host without paying that evolutionary cost of killing its host. And so then what we see when that virus crosses into a host that is a non-flying mammal that lacks these unique adaptations is that it tends to cause an extraordinary amount of pathology. So given all that you say, there's something Im implicit in what you say, and I'd like to ask both of you about this, is that a certain degree of certainty that this coronavirus came from a bat and was not, as some have suggested, the product of a super secret foreign laboratory involved in bio warfare experiments. How do you, how do we know that? How do we know what we know about the origins of this particular virus that we're dealing with now? Yeah, so um, there are sort of four different sub subclades in the coronavirus family. Uh, gamma and delta coronaviruses are thought to be reservoir to be hosted originally by birds and alpha and beta coronaviruses are thought to be, to find their reservoir hosts in bats. They're highly diverse in bat populations. So there's around 1500 described bat species on earth. And it's been predicted that there are well over 3000 to 4000 coronaviruses that infect bats. So on average, every given bat that will be hosting two different species of coronavirus. So the diversity is just vast. So there's a lot of material out there to begin with um, that suggests it's, it's very likely that a coronavirus that emerges in a, in a new mammal is going to be derived from a bat, especially if it's a, an alpha or beta coronavirus. And SARS-CoV-2 is a, a beta coronavirus. Um, and then in particular, we have 
really fantastic sequencing tools that, um, I mean, Britt mentioned how rapid the scientific response had been in the case of SARS-CoV-2 um, and really unprecedented in the rates at which we're seeing genome sequences of this virus from different human populations all around the world become publicly available for scientists to begin to piece together and analyze. And so very early on after the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was first published out of um, out of Wuhan, China, um, scientists were able to map that to the most closely derived previous, previously described uh, species of, of coronavirus out there. And this particular virus shares a 97% similarity with a previously described beta coronavirus derived from uh, a rhinophilid bat, which is a, a family of bats found in South Central China. And that's very close, but it's, it's not exact. Um, You've probably heard a bit of discussion about uh, pangolins in the literature as well. So what's really unique about this sequence of virus is that it most closely maps to this bat bat-derived coronavirus, um, but in the receptor binding domain, which is the segment of the virus genome that helps it bind to the human receptor ACE2, it has these six different residues, amino acid residues, so six sort of repeats that uh, almost precisely match those um, described yeah. from Malay Malaysian pangolins in, in the yeah. same wet market in Wuhan, China. Um, and those are different from those previously described in the bat. So we see evolutionary similarity mostly to the bat virus and then a little bit to the pangolin virus. Um, and the hypothesis actually is that there is a, a bat virus out there that we haven't described that probably gave rise to both of those at some point. But basically, um, for a number of reasons, we're very confident that this was not engineered in a laboratory, in particular that the viral sort of backbone um, that you would need to need to use to create SARS-CoV-2 doesn't, doesn't exist. It, it infects human cells in a way that's different from the previous SARS-CoV-1 virus using this combination of sequences in pangolins and in this other bat species. So if you were engineering a virus based on what was previously described in the literature prior to this outbreak, you would not have started with the sequence that we have currently. Um, and then in addition, uh, there are a few mutations in the receptor binding domain that we don't have any explanation for um, currently that are probably out there in previously unsampled viral diversity. And those two, um, it would be hard to engineer them and also very difficult for them to uh, evolve through natural evolutionary processes of serial passage in a laboratory where where humans are are mutating a virus across different cells. So we're very very confident that it's um, it's a zoonosis. So thanks, F really, fa it's fascinating to me how much we know and how much we don't know at the same time about about this particular virus. But Britt, let me ask you. I mean, given what Kara said about the pretty strong link between bats and the coronavirus we're dealing with right now and the involvement of wet markets and other markets where people are, you know, buying and assume, and we assume consuming wild animals. As a virologist, how do you feel about that? Is that something the world should be confronting right now? And should we be thinking about trying to shut them down? What kind of risk do they pose to us? Well, I'd say that Anytime you have a situation where different types of animals are held together in high stress situations, uh, that poses a risk for viral spread and it poses a risk for certain types of viruses to maybe mix, right? As Kara was talking about, you have something like a coronavirus and there are many other examples of this, flu is one of them, where there are types of coronaviruses that exist in bats types of coronaviruses that might exist in something like a pangolin or a civet cat or a camel, which is where MERS and the original SARS were thought to spill over from. Um, and though none of those may effectively be able to jump into the human population. They don't have the right set of, um, just the right sort of combination of traits that allow them to get into our cells. The problem comes when maybe those viruses mix together. You get uh, an animal that's stacked on, on a cage on top of another animal, and you have 
you know, urine or feces or saliva or something that's dropping down. Highly stressed animals, just like highly stressed humans, can have weaker immune responses and reactivation events. Uh, I, my lab studies herpes viruses actually, and we know that people are under high levels of stress tend to have more herpes virus reactivation events. That is probably true for other types of viruses as well. Mm. So things in a high stress environment can potentially lead to increased viral shedding. And then when you have different types of animals in close quarters mixing together, that provides an opportunity for potentially a virus from one animal to infect a cell of another animal that is also infected with a similar virus. Those viruses can mix, creating a new wow. type of virus that might have features that allow it to jump to different types of species. This is particularly relevant for viruses like influenza, where we know that genetic mixing happens. You hear of swine flu, right? Uh, and that is because pigs tend to be a mixing vessel for the avian influenza, which is what Kara describes as the reservoir host for uh, that virus. Birds don't generally get sick from flu, but they carry it in their GI tract. They can infect pigs, which have their own strain of flu. Those viruses can mix, creating new types of viruses that if they can jump into the human population, if they have just that right combination of features that allow them to infect us, well, we're in trouble at that point because those new viruses are things that our immune systems have never before been exposed to. And this is when the risk of pandemic arises. So a pandemic is something that you think of as, uh, you know, it's a, a convergence of many events, but very importantly, our first, that that virus has to be able to transmit efficiently from human to human. The first SARS outbreak and MERS, neither of those turned into pandemics. And the reason that they didn't turn into pandemics was not because those were not highly lethal viruses. In fact, they're more lethal than SARS-CoV-2. But the reason they didn't turn into pandemics is neither of those viruses spread as efficiently from human to human as CoV-2 does. And so we could contain them. So you need very efficient spread um, coupled with uh, uh, something that your immune system hasn't seen before. Mm. And so if your immune system hasn't seen it before, none of the pre-existing set of immunity that you have mm. protect you against these viruses. So let me draw another example back to the seasonal flu where we might get the flu every year, right? And um, and it feels terrible if you get the flu, everyone should get the flu vaccine. I get it religiously every year. <laughs> um, but if you happen to get the flu, it feels terrible. Um, most of the time you won't die. Of course, there's a sector of the population that, that influenza is, is very dangerous for. Um, but the reason that you won't die most of the time is you have some pre-existing immunity because you've seen this virus in the past. It comes around every year. It's a little bit different every year. It evolves every year so that it's not exactly the same, which is why it can continue to infect you. But your body has seen it before. With the new virus, if it comes in, the same with a pandemic flu that's mixed in another animal like a pig or something like that, or with something like SARS-CoV-2 that has jumped from bats, maybe through another animal into humans, our bodies have not seen that before. So we don't have any level of pre-existing immunity. And that really can increase the risk of, uh, of mm. pathogenicity of the sort of severity of the infection. It doesn't guarantee you that you're gonna have a highly severe infection as we know, thankfully for this virus, at least there are maybe 20 to 40% of individuals who get exposed to it that have um, few or only mild symptoms, which means it's not lethal for everyone. Um, but it can be much more lethal for many people in the population, particularly those with uh, underlying or pre-existing conditions. So the level of its lethality or you know, the threat that it poses to human health and life, notwithstanding its impact on the world, on the economy, on our lives is obviously extreme. And it seems as if the main event that we're kind of all looking towards and for is the development of the production of an effective vaccine. 
So can you talk to us, Britt, talk to us a little bit about what the vaccine options are that are currently under development, how they work, and what you think the odds are with this will break records in terms of bringing something to market? Yeah, this is a very important question because, as you said, I think our ability to develop a vaccine is the main hope to basically return to full normalcy. So the pressure to generate a vaccine is extraordinary. And so let me just spend a minute or so telling Please. you about how it is that a vaccine works and what are we doing to try and develop a vaccine? So first of all, uh, to explain this, what I need to explain is the concept of what are antigens. Antigens are the sorts of components of a virus or of a microbe that your immune system sees, recognizes as foreign, and tries to generate antibodies against to stop them. So I'm gonna to return to the analogy I used earlier of saying that the code of the virus is like, you know, maybe a car that is holding and protecting its driver. So if you think of the virus like that, there are many different types of viruses, many different brands of cars, some looks different, some look the same, a car comes into the body, all those different parts of the car, those are antigens. And so the body is gonna see those. It doesn't a priori know which of those parts it needs to stop. It's going to try and develop antibodies against many of them. What we want are to develop what are called neutralizing antibodies. And I'm sure everyone has heard this term a lot in the news, but it's important to distinguish that not all antibodies are neutralizing antibodies. So maybe the body will make you know, a, an antibody against something that would be akin to the roof of the car. Well, it can bind to the roof of the car, but that's not gonna stop the car from moving, right? It could still be useful in that it flags the car as unusual to help other cells in the body try and get rid of it, but it doesn't neutralize or stop the car. You want an antibody that in this uh, analogy is going to say bind to the wheel to stop that car from moving, bind to the ignition to stop that car from being turning on and, and moving. Those are the neutralizing antibodies that we need a vaccine to develop. So thanks to lots of previous work on other coronaviruses, um, including SARS coronavirus and coronaviruses that don't infect people at all, mouse coronaviruses, feline coronaviruses, that prior body of work over decades has helped people realize that the antigen that we need to stop, that we can use to make these neutralizing antibodies is that spike protein that's on mm. the surface. That the spike protein is the thing to generate neutralizing antibodies against for two reasons. First, it is the thing that the virus uses, it's the homing device that the virus uses to find and attach to the lung cell that it needs to get into. So without that spike protein, the virus cannot find the cell to deliver its payload. And so what the spike is doing is it's coming in, it's recognizing what we call the receptor. This is that ACE2 protein. This is a protein, turns out it has a, has a role normally in our body in regulating blood pressure. We don't know why that protein would have been selected by the virus uh, evolutionarily as its entry receptor, but nonetheless it is. So the spike comes in, it binds to that receptor. And so goal number one potentially for a vaccine is to generate antibodies that would block that interaction. If you can have something that binds to the spike here such that it cannot dock onto the receptor, that virus can't get into the cell. Hmm. Remember, because the virus is not alive, if it cannot get into the cell, it is inert. It can't replicate. It's for all practical purposes, dead. The second thing that might be useful is that in addition to just docking, the other role of the spike protein is that it's got a spring-loaded machinery hidden inside of it. So the top part of it is for binding and finding the cell. The second part, which is in what we would call the stock domain, a little bit lower, has this um, hidden spring-loaded machinery, which is called the fusion machinery. And this is a very important part of the spike protein because once that docking takes place, there's a cellular protein that's a sort of, you can think of it as molecular scissors. It comes and snips off 
the head of that spike protein, wow. allowing that spring-loaded fusion mechanism to unfold. And what that, uh, what that does is it causes the membrane that is the coat of the virus to fuse with the membrane that is the surface of the cell, creating a pore, allowing that payload of the viral genome to get into the cell. So antibodies that either block that interaction with the ACE2 receptor, or maybe prevent that uh, fusion mechanism from activating, binding other regions of the spike protein, those would be neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. So your question is how do we get those? How do we engineer vaccines to get neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein? There are uh, about six different strategies that, that scientists are actively pursuing on this front. Um, some of them are strategies that are, are basically tried and true strategies that we have many other vaccines have been built based on these basic principles. And some of them are new strategies that we have no record so far of vaccines that, that are in uh, existence and in use in public that use these, but they're creative and they're new. And the important thing is that we're trying everything at this point. So what are these, what are these sort of strategies? The sort of tried and true strategies come in a few different flavors. The first is, well, let's just make lots of copies of just that spike protein not the rest of the virus, just that protein and inject that protein into a person. The protein itself doesn't have any information to allow it to replicate. It's missing the genetic instructions of the virus. So it can't be harmful, but you're showing that protein to the immune system so it can start generating antibodies to block it. So that the next time, or if the person then gets infected with the virus, there will be antibodies there that already recognize the spike. Those are called subunit vaccines. The hepatitis B vaccine is an example of one that's already in existence like that. Other types of vaccines that, that people have generated in the past that are being explored are, well, you can take the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus and you can inactivate it. You can hmm. treat it with a series of chemicals that will, um, uh, that will basically cause the virus to not be able to get into a cell the genome will be cross-linked or um, destroyed or mutated in some way that it's basically non-functional. So uh, I'll use the term, the virus is dead, even though the virus was never alive in the first place. <laughs> it is incapable of doing anything, but it's got all the parts that are there. So you give that virus, this, what we would call an inactivated virus to an individual. So the immune system can see all the parts of the virus but that virus can't get into a cell and do anything. And so in the same way, it's making antibodies now, not just to spike protein, there are other proteins on the envelope um, that may you know, also help with the neutralization. The third strategy um, is to say, okay, let's, instead of just putting, making the spike protein on its own, let's take a virus that is a different virus that is not harmful to humans, um, either because it can't replicate in humans uh, or because it, it, it doesn't cause any disease in humans. And let's make that virus put the coronavirus spike on its surface. This is the basis for the Ebola virus vaccine. So what scientists did is they took a backbone of a virus called vesicular stomatitis virus. This is not a human virus, doesn't cause disease in humans. And they can put the spike protein gene uh, from coronavirus into that virus that will put the spike protein on its surface. Then you can put sort of this into humans and um, we will generate antibodies against that spike protein. Uh, and, and that uh, sort of harmless virus won't infect us. It's basically a vehicle to deliver um, the spike protein to the immune system. So there are um, uh, numerous um, uh, trials or, or um, efforts underway to try this both for this, this what's called the vesicular stomatitis virus backbone or um, a, an adenovirus backbone as well. So those are sort of the, I would say the more classic mechanisms. There are examples of FDA approved licensed in use vaccines for other pathogens using those strategies. 
And there are a couple of new ones that we're hearing a lot about in the news. Um, and these are the RNA vaccine and the DNA vaccine based virus uh, based uh, strategies. So here, the difference between these and the ones that I described before is that you are not, for, for all of the other ones, we're having as scientists to basically make the proteins in, in our own bioreactor factories, right? We make either, we grow up the viruses to inactivate them, we grow up the, the protein subunits in order to generate the vaccine. With the RNA-based vaccines or the DNA-based vaccines, the fundamental difference there is you are using your own body mm. as the factory to generate that wow. spike protein. So you take the sequence of the spike protein, you take that coding sequence, the set of instructions, and either in RNA form, which is the form that can be directly read by the ribosomes to make spike protein, or in the DNA form, which is similar to our genome, that would then first have to be uh, transcribed into RNA and then into protein. You just put that sequence, that nucleic acid sequence into humans and then have strategies to get that sequence into our cells and then use our own protein making mm. factories to make the spike protein, which will get either released from the cell or put on the surface of the cell and the immune system can see it uh, that way. So those are, those are, um, those are exciting sort of new ways of thinking about making vaccines, um, but uh, we don't yet have examples of them uh, existing and functioning yet. So there's some risk associated with them. I would say there's, there's a balance of you know, promise and risk there. <laughs> Each of these, you, one might ask, why do you have six different strategies for making a vaccine against the spike protein? Why, why not just you know, pick one and, uh, and, and put all your efforts in, in that uh, basket, particularly if we have strategies for making vaccines that we know have worked in the past. And the, the challenge is that um, we don't know exactly how best to get our body to make neutralizing antibodies. Um, the ability to get your immune system to stop a pathogen um, is not the same for every pathogen we wow. encounter. So a pathogen that enters your body in one way or tickles the immune system in one way, um, you may need to generate a slightly different type of immunity presented to the immune system a little bit differently in order to get your body to stop it. And we don't know enough yet about how our bodies see the SARS-CoV-2 to know which is the way that we can best make these neutralizing antibodies and make them in a way where the immunity will be sustained, right? Uh, there's clear evidence that uh, individuals who are infected with SARS-CoV-2, the same as when they were infected with SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS coronavirus, we can make neutralizing antibodies. We think patients make neutralizing antibodies against these viruses, but we don't know how effective those neutralizing antibodies are at preventing reinfection. We don't know how long those neutralizing antibodies, particularly for COVID-2, will stick around. Unfortunately for the circulating coronaviruses, the, the non-pathogenic ones, the ones that cause symptoms like the common cold, we know that while we make antibodies to those, they don't stick around very long. They're hmm. gone in a year or so. So that so this could be like a this could be like a yearly shot. You're saying it could be it. What that's the hope is to find ways to generate long-lasting immunity. Got it. Right. So even if the natural infection doesn't generate long-lasting immunity, and we don't know that yet, perhaps we can find a way to make a vaccine that will generate long-lasting immunity. It might have an immunity better than the natural infection. So that's, that's the hope. Um, and that's um, something that we just don't know whether that's gonna work yet, but that's sort of the, the dream here. And in addition to that, it's because we've been talking about coronaviruses continuing to having emerged already three times in the last you know, couple of decades and the concern that they may emerge again in the future is can we find a way to generate vaccines that will 
not just protect against this CoV-2, although that is priority number one, but might they protect against other coronaviruses as well? So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of um, complementary efforts and <laughs> levels of priority of, and refinements that are going to go in um, to these vaccine efforts. All right. So we only have a few minutes left, and I want to ask both of you just to sort of push you a little bit. What do you think the odds are that we're, some are saying we may have, and you mentioned, 12 to 18 months vaccine it would shatter previous records? Are we just being blindly optimistic or is there, do you think there's some valid reason to think that that time frame may be realistic? Um, Britt, let me start with you on that one again. I think it's aspirational. I will put it that way. Um, that uh, we have never had a vaccine quicker than five years, but there is reason to hope that this one can be much quicker than others. You, you know, instead of what normally might take two to three years to even develop a prototype to start to test, we, for this one, you know, scientists had prototypes in a matter of hours or days once the sequence was released. Um, uh, the, the RNA vaccine that you've been hearing a lot, Moderna, normally you have a long process of animal trials. That entire process was skipped because they had some prior safety data from, from, from other trials that they'd done. And so there are components of the process of um, the whole testing that can go quicker. The problem is, is that the, the efficacy issue of will, we can see if these vaccines, we can make them and probably pretty quickly see if they generate neutralizing antibodies, but we won't know how effectively they block until these immunized individuals start to re-encounter the virus and potentially get re-exposed and then see, did it work or didn't it work? And that's sort of a waiting game that one cannot rush because it's obviously not ethical to just inject somebody with the virus, right. given that we have no antivirals. Kara, what's your own perspective? And I just to pick up on a question that came in through Facebook now, people wondering about a more holistic approach that would have us making a global effort to shut down these wet markets and other areas where there may be transmission happening. Yeah, um, I mean, I would echo Brit on the aspirational approach to the vaccine. I would add that um, in addition to creating a functioning vaccine production and distribution are going to need to occur at unprecedented levels and rates. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be longer than that before the majority of, of people are um, actually obtaining that vaccine even after, even after it's in production. Um, I would say that um, I do a lot of infectious disease modeling and we often talk about transmission using this term beta, um, which, is, which is the transmission rate. And it's kind of a catch-all that incorporates both the contact rates between two different hosts, the infectiousness of the original hosts and the susceptibility of the recipient hosts. So when we're talking about a zoonosis that crosses species, these are contact rates between bats and humans, between bats and pangolins, if they need a chunk of pangolin virus in order to create a virus that's gonna to transmit to humans. When we talk about infectiousness, Britt mentioned herpes viruses that we often see that, um, that people are more uh, susceptible, for instance, when immunocompromised and when stressed. We also have evidence in the bat literature that in stressed environments, bats are actually shedding more virus. So more infection, so we might have a more infectious bat host in a stressed environment, a more susceptible human host in an immunocompromised state, and then that heightened contact rate. So any sort of environment that enhances any of those three components is going to increase the probability of these cross-species emergence events taking place. So um, certainly wet markets contribute to that extensively. Um, I do a lot of field work studying bat-borne zoonoses in parts of Africa where much of the, the bush meat consumption, the wild meat consumption is a source of, of subsistence. And it's hard to make an argument to quit eating wildlife when you don't offer any alternative. Certainly some of the communities in Northeastern Madagascar where I work for example, have been demonstrated to be so reliant on the wildlife trade that were you to remove that, that form of protein from their diet, they would become anemic. 
So I think we need to really have a nuanced approach to this, where if this is a subsistence uh, environment, we need to be offering viable domestic alternatives to, to protein food sources. But in the case of um, areas where this is more a specialty food source, um, I do think we need to be taking a hard look at at whether this this is really necessary because it it certainly is enhancing the the probability of these sorts of pandemics taking place. I would also just add that um, this has whole discussion um, and vaccine discussion has sparked a new debate in the wildlife zoonosis literature, where um, there's more and more talk about um, transmissible and transferable vaccines for wildlife to try hmm. and prevent some of these viruses from emerging. So, for instance, wait. So, a, are you are you talking about vaccinating animals? Yeah. Um, so vaccinating animals is a very effective way to eradicate rabies. So vaccinating wow. dogs, for example, um, is is the best way to prevent human rabies. Dogs account for 99% of human rabies cases globally, but in countries where domestic dogs are vaccinated, you don't have human rabies. Um, and there's a, a very effective uh, animal vaccine that works on vampire bats for rabies that has been made into a or a topical paste. So you put a paste on the bat's back and they can lick each other and transmit the vaccine from one bat to another that way. Um, and so this, there are a lot of challenges involved in identifying the virus in question and, and also creating um, a, a mechanism by which it can be transmitted. But certainly uh, SARS-CoV-2 and its impact and reach have really got scientists to start thinking outside of the box and thinking about these approaches um, much more universally. So that's been a discussion in my world most recently. Got it. So Britt, we have time for one more question and I wanna put it to you. So can you give people a sense from your perspective of what Berkeley faculty are doing to combat COVID-2? It's our colleagues at UCSF because they're clinical, they get a lot of well-deserved attention. And I, but I think there's a, my sense is there's a lot of work going on at Berkeley behind the scenes. Can you give us just a really a brief overview, give folks a sense of what's going on? I can. There is actually a remarkable amount of work that's going on on the Berkeley campus that covers a huge diversity of topics related to the, the COVID pandemic. Um, so there, much of this work, although certainly not all of it, but a lot of the work is being spearheaded through the um, Innovative Genomics Institute, the IGI, which is helping to bring people together um, to collaborate on areas related to diagnostics using next generation uh, CRISPR technologies in order to better detect SARS-CoV-2, lots of work on the epidemiology and the sequencing based efforts to try and do community based longitudinal studies, studies in California farm workers, um, uh, setting up a screening center that works with uh, many different areas of, of the of our local community to uh, try and identify cases. Um, in addition to things like better understanding the, the virology, the life cycle, the pathogenesis of this virus, because you cannot design effective drugs against something that you don't know how it works. Many researchers in that area. And then in addition, there are researchers who are actively working towards vaccines and therapeutics against SARS-CoV-2. Um, for example, again, using CRISPR technologies to try and enhance the uptake of things like the DNA vaccine so that mm. they might be more effective, um, developing uh, small molecule inhibitors of some of the core coronavirus enzymes to stop the virus in the track in its tracks or antisense oligonucleotides to block the virus. And, and also a social science front trying to, uh, to implement um, and understand, uh, you know, implement things like virtual mentoring to understand that this pandemic right. is differentially affecting many of the graduate students and undergraduate students and researchers who can't get the experiences and the training that they need. Um, and so how can we um, through, in addition to the basic science and the translational science, make sure that we are attending um, to the social science aspects uh, and, and a very holistic approach to, to tackle this pandemic. So I, I've been really impressed with the level of engagement across the Berkeley campus for this. In addition to my, uh, in my home department, uh, Plant Microbial Biology, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And so there are efforts there as well, even in things like generating um, uh, uh, hand sanitizer uh, and wipes, which is also being done in the molecular and cell biology department. So people are engaged really at all levels in a way that's um, uh, quite inspirational. 
So my understanding, actually, this 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 event we had today is the first in the whole speaker series to celebrate that 30th anniversary. For people who want more information about the events that are scheduled, where should they go? Do you have a website? Where where do you want to point people to? Yep, I think that there's going to be um, uh, a link that's put in the Zoom chat where you can identify. We don't uh, have or a be Zoom. able to see. Okay, yeah, we don't. We're gonna, we will, we will post a link, certainly go to the pmb.berkeley.edu website um, or the Rosser College of Natural Resources website. And there will be links there to a series of additional panel discussions that are gonna be held in honor of the many contributions to human health, to animal health, to plant health that the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology has contributed over the last 30 years. So really, I want to thank both of you for what's been, Karen Britt, for a fascinating conversation. I Certainly in my life, I, there's never been a phenomenon, a, a development that's been quite this combination of scary and fascinating and perplexing and confusing. And you've really, I think, uh, helped a lot of people here begin to understand what's at the very core of what we're confronting now. Um, so again, thanks again. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. And please check the Berkeley Conversations website. We're gonna have uh, more events in the future throughout the summer. We're gonna be expanding our subjects to include uh, racial justice and policing and law enforcement really to begin to tackle additional issues of the day beyond the coronavirus epidemic. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's been an honor to talk to you.